Hello, Sean. Hi, George. How's it going? Good. How are you? Very good. So we're uh, talking to you from your office, is that right? Yes. I tried to do the home thing, but the phone technology just wasn't up to it. So uh. the office <laughs> here at Caltech is marginally better, marginally more technologically capable. Well, I should say that uh, you recently recently uh, got an appointment at Caltech, the California Institute of Technology there in Pasadena. That's right. It used to be little known, but now it's become famous because it's on numbers on TV. So people know about Caltech. <laughs> oh, that's now. right. And I moved here just in September. Oh, this year. well, you know, I know the the, the producer of, of numbers. Ah. She says, and she writes some of the episodes. She's this really, really nice woman. Um, she came to Santa Fe, oh, I don't know, at least a year ago, and um, we had went went to lunch out at my favorite place to have lunch with people in the Plaza Diner, and she was telling me about a new show that she was um, to pitching to um, the people in Hollywood, and it was going to be based on a small scientific research institute, you know, something like the Santa Fe oh, okay. Institute, yes. and she'd yes. been up there talking to Jeffrey Wolf, the president of the Santa Fe Institute, and a, and a fellow physicist. Mm -hmm. This I, was before Numbers came out? This yeah, this was while this? Numbers was, um, was out. It, it was oh, okay. fairly new. I hadn't heard of it then, but then I started watching it occasionally, especially if she was writing an episode. And but I guess she was um, she was pitching a different series that hasn't yet yet um, found a found a producer or money or however that works. It's all well, we Hollywood types would be able to explain to you yet yeah, there's a lot of development hell that goes on yeah. about time. Yeah, you you, you know this stuff, ideas. right? Now, now that there. I've moved to Hollywood, yeah, sure. Well I noticed your home phone number is uh, two one Area code? 213, that's right. So that's like classic, the classic uh, Los Angeles area code. I actually live in downtown Los Angeles, really? not in Pasadena. Yeah, wow. that's right. Like near MacArthur Park? Or? Yeah, so don't tell anyone, but the people who live in Pasadena, Pasadena is nice enough that the people who live here never leave. Yeah. So when I was shopping around for places to live, I decided I would not live in Pasadena because it's nice, but I will come here every day. Yeah, and no, yeah, downtown Pasadena's LA nice. is undergoing a renaissance. Oh, well, I'd, I'd right much there. rather live in Los Angeles than Pasadena. Yeah. yeah. Pasadena has always struck me as a little stuffy. Yeah, you know, there's the Athenaeum, the faculty club with pictures of Einstein around. Oh, yeah, the Athenaeum. Yeah, Murray Gelman called it the mausoleum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. well, it's a faculty club. What do you expect? Yeah, That's Italian right. Renaissance yeah. gaudy faculty club. That's I really right. liked it. I stayed there a couple of times in one of the rooms when I was writing my biography of Gelman. And oh, okay, yes, sure. Yeah. That's right. Now, I forgot that you must have haunted these very halls. Where oh, yes, is. indeed. I would walk, like uh, I would get up in the morning, and I even got to, I didn't stay in the Einstein suite, which is, I guess. I did. Did you? That's pretty I nice, isn't it? That's very nice, the Einstein yeah. suite. Yeah, they gave him a good one. I know my friend James Glick stayed there when he was writing his Feynman biography. Mm -hmm. but, uh, no, I settled for a lesser room, but I did get get the maid one morning to show me the Einstein suite. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a good investigative reporter. What Indeed, yes. And then I, I would get up in the morning and I'd walk down the Olive Walk to the yes. other side of campus. Yes. There were the, um, where the theoretical physics department. Well, is. that's where I am. I'm on the fourth floor of Lauritsen. Oh, uh, Lauritsen, right. Sure. Yeah. Just across the other side of the hallway is where uh, Feynman and Gilman's offices were. Oh, and okay. Yeah. My uh, the desk in my office used to be Richard Feynman's. Really? So, yes. Oh, that's, that's great. Right. Is, is there a graffiti? There's no graffiti. You... There's a little sticker on the bottom that says Feynman's desk. <laughs> that's wonderful. And we have looked at all the other desks, and none of them have a sticker saying Feynman's desk. <laughs> so this must be right. It must be. Yeah. Yeah, and Helen Tuck was the secretary that was. Sat in between uh, Feynman and Gelman and got to That's listen right. to them. Listen it's to due them to her that this desk is still uh, used by a physicist rather than in a Feynman memorabilia room. Oh, she well, that's to be good. Continuous use I'm sure Feynman would, would have wanted that. Yeah, I hope so. That's right. Yeah. Well, I should say a little more about you. Um, I think a lot of people already already know you know you who certainly who follow the um, the so-called science blogosphere and that um, you. Um, Started out doing a blog called Preposterous Universe. That's right. Yes. And then this sort of uh, segue, segued, we always say segued in blogging heads, I noticed, <laughs> and, um, into, um, into uh, cosmic variants. Mm -hmm. I was just looking. I was, I'm not really much of a blog reader, so I've been catching up on your, your work in the last, uh, last few days. And I was amused to see that uh, cosmic variants is a term that refers to the little core of unreducible or irreducible uncertainty that will always exist because we live in just one universe. I'm glad someone gets at the one joke time. Here, yes. I, that's, that's me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Almost preposterous. As, as you might imagine, there was plenty of talking back and forth about what the best name would be. We had a long list of 30 or 40 different possibilities. Oh. On Cosmic and you're, and it's, it's you and several other... other yeah, uh, we have seven of us. So seven now. Total, yeah, right you now. seem yeah. to be the most prolific. Is that... Yeah, um, I am. I blog more than the others, but I think it's definitely a better place for having more than one person doing. it. Yeah, no, I think that's program. really good too because yeah. a lot of these things get so solipsistic after after yeah. a while. Not that that's bad, but yes, yeah. it's good to sort of be jolted out of your dogmatic slumber. <laughs> right, your co-bloggers. And you've written about everything from, of course, um, theoretical physics and cosmology, and a lot of your research is involved with um, dark energy. Or possibly mm-hmm. the alternative to modifying gravity to explain why the universe is accelerating in its expansion? Yes, absolutely. That's the big uh, question in cosmology these days. We, uh, I got lucky to be born at the right time as far as this is concerned, because I was a postdoc in 1998 when we made this tremendous discovery that the universe is not just expanding, but it's accelerating. Yeah. And so now the race is on. It's full employment for theorists. We need to explain this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that was really just came out of nowhere, didn't it, as far as what was established so far in theory and what people were expecting? It came out of somewhere, not quite nowhere. Yeah. In fact, the reason why I was uh, personally well-situated to think about it is that I wrote a review article in 1992 when I was a graduate student with Bill Press and Ed Turner mm-hmm. about the possibility of vacuum energy, the cosmological constant. Oh, something that had been around since Einstein and bounced back and forth and was regularly dragged out of the idea hat to explain some unknown observations. Yeah. Uh, So everyone knew about the possibility, and they were interested in killing it off. And uh, then in 1998, these groups said, no, actually, it's true. And they had, for the first time, actually pretty convincing evidence for Ah. it. And this is, uh, en- it's basically, there's energy in the nothingness of the universe that would uh, propel such a cosmological expansion. Yeah, the idea of the cosmological constant is just that in empty space itself, there is energy. Yeah. Even if you have no stuff, no particles, no light or heat or radiation, no dark matter or anything, mm. every cubic centimeter still has a non-zero amount of energy. Yeah. 10 to the minus 8 ergs per cubic centimeter, Ergs, in case you yeah. need the number. Um, and that energy has an effect, namely it makes the universe accelerate. Yeah. So now we've discovered the universe is accelerating, and this might be the cause, yeah. or there might be some other cause, so that's why we're writing papers about it. Yeah, most of the, it seems like most of the science reporting you read sort of gives you the impression that uh, everyone's on the cosmological constant bandwagon, that, but, it's, but there are still alternatives that are being... Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, before we had the cosmological constant, we had really good theoretical naturalness arguments Mm -hmm. that it wasn't there. Yeah. And those arguments were not right. Well, Einstein called it his his greatest blunder, right? His greatest blunder, that's right. famously read too many times, and every time people talk about it. Yeah, well, I mean, you sit down and do a back-of-the-envelope calculation, and you ask yourself, if there could be vacuum energy, how much should there be? What should the natural value be? And you get a number that is bigger than what we've observed by a factor of 10 to the 120. (laughs) This ridiculous disagreement between theory and observation, the worst ever. So it's so it would it seemed to be a case where you'd either have nothing or or you'd have this huge amount of vacuum energy, and instead we have this little tiny smidgen of it. Is that? Yeah, that's right. So I came up with an analogy for Mm -hmm. what this is like because people say, well, just because you know it's small, what made you think it was zero? And the answer is, so you're walking down the street. And you meet a guy on the street, it's late at night, he's like doing street performing, and he's flipping a coin. And he says, okay, you tell me whether this coin is going to come up heads or tails. Mm-hmm. And you guess heads, and he flips it and it comes up tails. And he flips it again and again and it comes up tails. And he does it 299 times, mm-hmm. and it's tails every time. And so he says, okay, the next time, what are you going to guess it is? Now, you don't know what's going on. You don't know why it's come up tails every time, 299 times, Mm -hmm. but it's easier for you to guess that you're dealing with a rigged coin somehow, and it's going to come up tails again. Yeah, yeah. But on the 300th time, he flips it and it comes up heads. That's what we're dealing with with the cosmological constant. (laughs) Something is making it much, 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 much smaller, two to the minus 300 times smaller than it should be. Yeah. But it's not zero. Yeah. What kind of thing does that? That's a mystery. Ah. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) So yeah, that's about the basic right. question is, I mean, that's, of course, one of the, one of the big questions that superstring theorists have been, been grappling with. And 
Well, that's right. If you claim to have a theory of everything, yeah. then everything should include the vacuum energy. Right. I remember and years ago talking to Il Eva Silverstein about that when mm -hmm. she, she had just gotten one of those MacArthur... MacArthur Awards that that's right, that yes. are called Genius, the Genius Awards Store, yeah. to the great annoyance of the MacArthur Foundation for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they're very annoyed to get all that publicity. From yeah, that's the right. Genius yeah, it must, be, must right. be a terrible thing. Yeah. yeah, well, we've been thinking about it. String theorists, of course, have been thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, for better or for worse, what happened when astronomers discovered that the universe was accelerating, mm -hmm. that was a piece of data that string theorists needed to take into account when they were trying to reconcile string theory with the real world. Yeah. And before that, they were looking for versions of string theory that would give you zero vacuum energy. Right, right. And that was and hard suddenly, enough. And now suddenly, they need to give you uh, a version of string theory that gives you a tiny but not zero vacuum yeah. energy. Yeah. And that did affect how string theory is done. That led to the whole landscape. Phenomenon. Right, right. Um, yeah, we sh maybe we should back up a little bit and say, I remember... You know, we were talking about this the last time I saw you, which I guess was also the first time we'd actually ever met in... Non-virtually, yes. Yeah, Non-virtually. And I, it was when I was at the uh, Codley Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara, a science writer in residence. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think, maybe the first day I was there, and uh, Steve Schenker, who's a uh, you know, super string theorist at Stanford, um, was Grabbed down a bottle there. of scotch in one hand. Yeah, and and yeah, hundred into yeah. the ITP lounge. Exactly, he said. He said, "I got a hundred dollar bottle of scotch here, which is it was more than a hundred, but yes, yeah, it was well, very, very good. <laughs> more than a hundred. Yeah, it was out of my league, but yeah, and uh, he had lured us all into this place they call the Tower. Yes, this wonderful that's right. Second a new story part of room the that looks out over the Pacific, and yeah, and you were there, station, and. Really. Um, and Steve and uh, Joe Polchinski came in later, who's of course one of the one of the real, real leading theorists in string theory, and I guess who had much to do with introducing the idea that there's not just strings but yeah. brains, these multi-dimensional. It wasn't just one-dimensional things. Right, and then uh, Eva yeah. Silverstein was there down from Stanford, along with uh, Shamit Kachru. And there were a lot of IQ points in that room, and we were also there. Yes. Yeah, and everyone was really really very upset because Lee Smolin's book had recently come out, uh, what The Trouble with Physics, and so yep. had Peter White's, uh, White's book, uh, Not, Even Not Even Wrong, and they were, yeah. and, and the discussion was kind of, you know, well, what, you know, this we're getting this really bad publicity, and we think, you know, it's mostly off base, and how do we counteract that? And this was a theme that kind of ran through my entire two months there at Kavli, and people were really, really Yeah, there was a string theory program going on while you were there. Exactly. It was just after, right. it was last fall, so it was just after the summer in which Lee's book and Peter's book came out. Yeah, yeah, so and the timing was just perfect for that to... A perfect storm, that's right. The perfect string theorists were like, we've been, you know, working hard on our theory, and we like our theory. Why is the whole world coming crashing down on us? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in fact, New Scientist just had me write a little piece uh, a few weeks ago because on our blog on Cosmic Variants, I had mentioned that from what you would read in the media, you would think that string theory is all but done for, but actual string theorists are going along right. quite undisturbed right. in their research. Right. And they asked me to write a little uh, one-page article pointing that out because they said, yeah, our, our readers and our editors are convinced that string theory is on it in its last throes. Right. It's going to go away any minute now. Yeah. That is not actually the case. So you get a slightly uh, distorted view of the view inside academia from uh, just reading it from the books in the popular press. Yeah, and I gave gave a talk about about that, and where I was trying to, you know, make the point about how, you know, in some ways it's a coincidence that these two books came out at the same time, but that of course amp they, that make they mutually amplify each other's Absolutely, message, yeah. and people think, well, wow, if two of these books just came out, you know, one out of left field and one out of right field, the same publishing season, and then it gets picked up by the blogs and starts uh, resonating through the blogosphere, and, you know, Peter White has his own blog, mm -hmm. Not Even Wrong, and then there's this um, character at, um, at Harvard, um, oh, Lubosch Model. Yeah, Lubosch Model, who I guess is, uh, is uh, Czech. Yeah, he's left Harvard now, actually. He's oh, back in okay. Czechoslovakia. Oh, I didn't so know that. So he's taken it upon himself to defend the honor of string theory. Yeah, but in a very, very nasty, nasty yeah. attack sometimes on people who, who questioned it. That was one of the, th the themes that kept coming up when I was at Kavli and when we were drinking Steve's expensive scotch was, um, you, know, we, you know, it's really 
not in our service that this is the person that, at least in the blogosphere, is being identified with being this pro-string theory guy. Well, I've said this for a long time, that string theorists, um, you know, they, they do think, and I think with some justification, that right now they're, the public image of how well string theory is doing is not reflecting the reality of how it's doing. But, of course, in the past it's been the other way around. It's mm. been overhyped, yeah. and the public image might have gotten ahead yeah. of where the science is by some substantial amount. Yeah, so you swing from Brian Greene's book, uh, Elegant Universe on one pole to uh, Peter White's book, Not Even Wrong, on the other. With And the truth lies somewhere, of course, in the middle of the pendulum swing. Yeah, but I think string theorists, I've often said that they are a little bit insular and unconcerned about their public image. And yeah. this is a very general notion of public image. I mean, even among working physicists who are not string theorists. Yeah. Uh, a lot of string theorists prefer to just do their research and just well, do string yeah. theory, and you can't blame them. That's what people yeah, do. Yeah, that's what it's all, how it's all. I mean, it's really kind of a fairly modern phenomenon where a group of um, theorists would have to worry about their public media image. Well, <laughs> it depends on what you mean by, again, the public. I mean, yeah. it's true that, uh, you know, hiring a, a, a PR firm is something that is probably beyond what most academics would prefer to get into. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, if we do specialize in some recondite technical area, part of our responsibility is to explain to other people what we are doing and why we are doing yeah. it, yeah. and why it's worth doing it. Yeah. And one of the points that I make is that this perpetuation of string theory within the ivory tower is not a self-perpetuation. String mm -hmm. theorists need to be hired and they need to get funding. Yeah. And for the most part, the department chairs and the people at NSF and DOE who are doing the grant allocations are not string theorists. Yeah. The string yeah. theorists have succeeded in convincing their colleagues within physics that what they're doing is something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's also a kind of a unique project because they've been going for years and years now without any direct contact with experiment. Yeah. And I think that even within the physics community, some people's patience is beginning to run thin. Right. They want to see some results, so they're going to say, you know, why are we putting so much of our effort, so much of our very scarce resources in terms of faculty positions or something like that yeah. into a field which still hasn't quite paid off. Well, yeah, Sheldon Glashow, the, the Harvard uh, High Energy Physicist Nobel Prize winner, recently made... Uh, Meter, made a rather snide, snide comment about superstring theory. Did you see that? Uh, this is not his original one about comparing it to yeah, theology one, years so and years ago, so. but something about uh, superstring theorists are very cl so clever that I'm sure they'll come out with a way to explain any experiment uh, in terms of superstring theory. That was kind of the gist of it. But, well, uh, it's a little bit it's a little bit unfair yeah. because um, string theory is trying to do something really, really ambitious. Mm -hmm. It's trying to extrapolate from physics that we know now many orders of magnitude past what we have experimental access to these days. Yeah. So it's by no means a surprise that string theory has not yet made some specific experimental yeah. prediction. Yeah. And if it doesn't make such a prediction for the next 10 years, it still won't be a surprise. It still will not mean that string theory is not right. right. It just means that it's hard. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a very, you know, if, if the critics of string theory had as their main point the claim that, look, you guys are just too ambitious. You're just trying to do something that we don't have the technology to do now. We should keep closer to home, mm -hmm. I think that would be a much more compelling critique than most of the ones that I've actually heard. Yeah, yeah. Well, and Lee, Lee's critique, Lee, Lee Smolin, um, uh, I noticed, on Co was that on Cosmic Variance where Joe Polchinski reviewed, reviewed Lee's book and, they, and it ended up in this really interesting dialogue that's kind of you know, gone on and on for a while. That's right. Lee is a frequent commenter at our blog. And yeah. so Joe wrote a review for American Scientists. Mm -hmm. oh, and okay. the beauty of blogs, it's really hard these days for me to write or contribute to non-blogging mm -hmm. uh, things because blogs have no space restrictions. They, I can be as sarcastic or as personal as I want, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. both Joe and I separately reviewed Lee's book, and we had versions of our reviews that were longer and had some more details that couldn't fit into the published version. Oh, ah, okay, so you were so able we to... put them on the blog, and they're not only can we expound at whatever length we want, and not only can we have footnotes that go into more technical detail, but then there can be a give and take mm -hmm. in the comments afterward. 
Well, I noticed that one of the, one, one of the points that uh, Joe Polchinski had really, really objected to in, in Lee's book was that Lee was saying that when dark energy was discovered, that this had been so completely out of the blue and just it hadn't been predicted by superstring theory at all and that this um, helped uh, precipitate, or not helped, but precipitated this crisis that led to this idea of the landscape where there mm -hmm. may be 10 to the power of 500 different superstring theories uh, leaving us to wonder why we happen to live in this, you know, one particular instantiation. So I guess, again, yeah. that's the cosmic variance problem. <clears throat> and there was a, uh, and Joe sort of took objection to the way that that was portrayed. And I think that I'm coming down on uh, Joe's side in this debate. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's even fair to call the landscape business a crisis. It's, it's what happens when you get data yeah. and you use data to inspire you to uh, build your theories in a better way. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Whether the landscape exists or not is a true-false question, not a good versus evil question yeah. or right-wrong yeah. question. Yeah. But, um, yeah, a lot of people before the supernova results came out in 1998 thought that the cosmological constant was zero. We were all trying to come up with theories that had no vacuum energy, mm -hmm. that space was flat and would be unaccelerated. Mm -hmm. And within string theory, uh, it was thought that that would be easier to do than to come up with theories where the cosmological constant was positive. Yeah. There's all sorts of techno technical things here, like no one was really saying that you couldn't have a positive cosmological constant, but they were saying things like you couldn't have a positive cosmological constant that was truly stable and things like that. Yeah. And then, of course, when the vacuum energy was discovered, if that's what it is, the fact that the universe is accelerating, they said, okay, well, we have to deal with this, and so they are dealing with not quite stable vacuum, okay. and they find 10 to the 500 of them. And, yeah, that was this paper by, it was Shamit Kachru and... Shamit Kachru, KKLT. KKLT, yeah. Yeah, Kalosh, uh, Linde, and Trivedi. Right, and, and that basically basically you went from saying, well, now that we have to accommodate this idea that we do have this cosmological constant, or we possibly have it, and it's not huge, but it's actually rather small. Mm -hmm. How do we um, explain this with superstring theory? And it led to this idea that um, it would be so unconstrained that you'd have the, the 10 to the power of 500 different universes, each with um, different laws. Yeah, and That's so the but it's not, this is not a choice that you have. This yeah. is either what string theory predicts or doesn't. Yeah. And it's still an open question. It's yeah. not absolutely set in stone. Yeah. And but could you talk a little bit about why that's called the landscape, just for Sure. For I mean, the general here. idea is that the good news is that there, as far as we can tell, is only one string theory. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, it's not even string theory. It's something called M-theory. Right. And what we used to think were the different versions of string theory are actually just different limiting cases of M-theory. Mm -hmm. That's the good news. And then you run into a bunch of bad news. The bad news includes the fact that when you say what is M-theory, you say, well, it's the theory that has string theory as different limiting cases. It's very difficult to give a once and for all short description of what M-theory itself is. We're yeah. still not sure in different circumstances. Yeah. The other bad news is that when you say, okay, you have this M-theory, what kind of versions of M-theory look like a four-dimensional world? Yeah. We live in a world that has three dimensions of space, one of time. We know that there's different versions of M-theory that look ten-dimensional, and there's even a version that looks eleven-dimensional. How many are there that look four-dimensional? Mm -hmm. And the answer is there's a bunch. There's possibly ten to the five hundred or some ridiculous yeah. number like that. Yeah. And these are like different phases of space-time. It's, it's not really different theories. Yeah. It's like you can have ice or water, or water vapor is different phases of water. You have three different phases that we're familiar with. Yeah. This is saying that space itself has 10 to the 500 different phases. It's called a landscape because we have this image of, um, like this multiverse, which we can think of as this multi-dimensional landscape with peaks and valleys, and each little little nook and cranny is a different one of the 10 to the 500 universes? Yeah, we have this idea that there's a whole bunch of parameters, a whole mm -hmm. bunch of fields that can take on different values, and it's like a ball rolling down some very, very complicated set of hills. Right. And of all these different parameters that can take on different values, the ones that can sit there and be relatively stable are the ones that correspond to minima, sitting at the bottom of a valley yeah. in that landscape of possibility. Okay. And there's just a bunch of them. And if that's true, then you have to deal with it. Yeah. And whether or not you like it or not does not affect whether it is true or false. I mean, it seems that 
when I really first started following superstring theory after, I don't know, was it the second revolution or third revolution, but it was shortly after Polchinski's paper introducing brains and all these other interesting objects, and it became M-theory, which some people s said stood for magical, mystical, right. or mother of all theories. And, and at that point, I think the big message that uh, was coming out, at least in the articles that, that we were writing as journalists, was that, well, yeah, it does seem crazy, this idea that we could have ten dimensions of space and all of these strange multi-dimensional objects within this, but the price is that uh, when all the details are figured out, it will point to one unique theory. This will show why the universe has to be the way it is. And instead, it's led to the landscape where we're saying that maybe the only way we can say the universe is the way it is is because of the anthropic argument that, well, you know, it happened to be the way it is because it could produce beings like you and I who could sit around and come up with super string theory. So well, to me, I that's what we found so dissatisfying. Bit. Well, when yeah. you say that uh, the way that it is is because it had to be that way to come up yeah. with us, I mean, I would, I would say it as we, the idea is that we live in a universe where conditions are very different from place to place, yeah. and we only arise in those parts of the universe where conditions let us arrive. Yeah. <coughs> and that's not really surprising at all. I mean, no, uh, that's, is yeah, I know what you within mean. the solar system, yeah. we arose on the surface of the Earth. Right. We didn't arise on Mercury yeah. or on Jupiter yeah. or in between the planets. Yeah. And nobody is surprised, even yeah. though Jupiter has a lot more surface area than the Earth does. Yeah. So maybe the universe is like that. Maybe the universe is not like that. We're trying yeah. to figure it out, and we'll just have to live with whatever yeah. the answer is. Well, isn't, I mean, the landscape, I mean, it's really one of these powerfully... Powerfully, uh, what would the word be? Um, tautological arguments that I mean, it's I mean, it's obviously true. <laughs> no, it is not. It really, really is not obviously true. It, it seems tautological to me there, in a way, and I don't mean that negatively. I mean, it means tautological to me in the same way that uh, that um, ra that variation in natural selection is tautological. But it's not. It could have been different. Yeah. Could, you don't need natural selection. Yeah. You don't need to have descent with random variation. Mm. You don't need to have the genetic information that is passed down from generation to generation mm. be digital rather than analog, mm. which is necessary mm -hmm. for natural selection to work. Mm. Likewise, there's a tautological version of the anthropic principle that says we can only exist in conditions under which we can exist. Mm -hmm. Duh. That's kind of tautological. Yeah. We don't really explain anything by saying that. But there's also a non-tautological version that mm -hmm. says that conditions in our universe that we observe, which appear to us to be unnatural, are only appearing unnatural because the part of the universe we observe is one element of an ensemble. Yeah. So we have nat numbers like the cosmological constant or other numbers that we measure in particle physics that we say, that's not the number we expect. This mm -hmm. is very surprising to us. It mm -hmm. could be that there is an explanation for these unnatural numbers yeah. in terms of a measure over some ensemble of possibilities. Yeah. If that's right, it is not tautological. It could be wrong. Mm -hmm. It might not be true. Mm -hmm. So if all you use the anthropic principle for is saying that conditions in the universe are consistent with us being here, that's sort of useless and a waste of time. Oh, I see. But if instead we're asking, should we be looking for a unique dynamical explanation for the value of the vacuum energy? Mm -hmm. Or should we just be able to live with it because if it were its natural value, we wouldn't be here? Yeah. That's a theoretical choice that has ramifications. It's not wow. tautology. Yeah. But though, if you have this ensemble of possibilities and such a huge ensemble it apparently is. Doesn't this really, really abandon the original promise of superstring theory is giving you the unique, the unique theory? Well, the answer that I kind of want to give to that question is I don't care. Mm -hmm. I don't care what the theorists said about string theory yeah. when it was originally introduced. What I care is whether string theory is right 
or wrong. Well, of course. I don't want to blame the theory for yeah. the shortcomings of the theorists. Yeah. And this yeah. happens all the time in cosmology, which is what my actual specialty uh-huh. is. That, right. that a new theory comes along and the theorists say that it predicts something, mm-hmm. and it doesn't because mm-hmm. they're sort of taking a shortcut. Yeah. And then that thing that they predicted turns out not to be right, and they have to backtrack and say, well, actually our theory is still compatible with the data for this reason. Right. So it was true that the hope of string theorists in the 1980s was not only that the theory was essentially unique, but that within a few years we would use that uniqueness to solve all of our problems in particle physics and make unique predictions for what would appear at particle accelerators in the near future. Yeah. And that didn't happen. Right. And that's too bad, and it's not string theory's fault. No. It's string theorists' fault. Right. Right. And the world is what it is. If someone comes along with a better theory of quantum gravity that does everything string theory does and is unique, People will switch to that. Yeah. That's all you need to do. Yeah. But and, it's uh, hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so guess. actually, I was interested, I wanted to um, mention, in, the, in this context of sort of thinking about the challenges to string theory from the point of view of the general public or reporters thinking about it, there's an interesting parallel, that I don't know if you noticed, that um, about economics. Mm-hmm. And the New York Times reported on this just a few days ago, and there was an article um, a month ago in The Nation that really set it off about the discipline of heterodox economics. Have you seen this? Yeah. Yeah, remind us what that was. So the idea is that there's a set of economists who are, you know, uh, respectable people in the sense that they're professors, and mm-hmm. they even, uh, you know, they publish real articles, and they even sometimes win awards. But they think of themselves as heterodox because they're challenging what they see as the mainstream, ultra-free market, rational choice theory kind oh, of right. yeah. viewpoint. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was an entertaining article in The Nation about, you know, going to a conference and seeing how the heterodox economists are sort of marginalized in the basement rooms of the yeah. conference and so forth. And it really reminded me of this sort of um, loop quantum gravity or dynamical triangulation or whatever version of quantum gravity versus the mainstream consensus of string theory. Yeah. And not necessarily that academically the two are analogous, mm-hmm. but from the point of view of an outsider trying to understand it, there's a problem here. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're facing with a technical, sophisticated, mature academic field in which you are not an expert, and you uh, talk to people and you find that there's a subset of these people who are respectable and have faculty jobs but think of themselves as a minority with viewpoints and techniques and practices that are not quite shared by the majority, Mm -hmm. And they think that they're thinking outside the box and contributing something deep and profound. Right. But they're complaining that they're kept out of the best faculty jobs and the best journals and the best awards and stuff like that. Yeah, right. So basically what Lee Smolin is claiming. It's a a very analogous kind of rhetoric. But if you talk then to the people who are purportedly the establishment, they say, you know, we're not oppressing these people because they don't buy into our orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. We just don't think they're right. We just think that they're wrong. And so why should we be giving them faculty jobs if they're wrong or their research is unpromising or something like that? And those of us who are on the outside looking in as spectators and and physics fans are... It's no real way to to judge whether or not these people are really deep and profound, but rocking the boat, or they're just wrong. Yeah. And I actually don't know the answer to this problem as an outsider. How do you judge the difference between those two things? Because you can certainly hear very intelligent and articulate insiders taking opposite sides Mm -hmm. of the different things. So this, to me, is what makes it so exciting, just that sense of intellectual ferment and of so much still being up in the air and... Yeah, I mean, the uh, in the context of blogs, I mean, you mentioned some of the bloggers who go back and forth about this, yeah. and despite what people might have guessed, scientists are just as uh, many drama queens per capita as any other occupation. <laughs> I know. Uh, and they all <laughs> tend to uh, appear on the Internet in different forms. Yeah, yeah. But the good news is that it really means that people are very passionate about this stuff. Yeah, it might seem yeah. a little esoteric and recondite, but, you know, people care about whether or not space is really four-dimensional or ten-dimensional. Right. Which is kind of nice. Right. Yeah, this whole super-string popular culture is a rather amazing Well, yeah, as a cosmologist, I get, I get the same thing. I mean, I'm, I'll be sitting out there at dinner by myself reading a technical book on cosmology, and 50% of the time the 
survey server will say, you know, what book is that? What are you reading? And you know, explain this to me. And people really love this stuff. Yeah. And I think that yeah. as a community, uh, even though people like Brian and uh, Lisa Randall and Stephen Hawking have done a great job at bringing some of that excitement to a wider audience, mm -hmm. I still think the demand is dramatically underserved yeah. by really, really good explanations of some of the ideas that we're thinking about. Yeah. There's plenty of people who want to know more. Yeah, yeah. And, and if they look at the right blogs, I mean, I've learned a lot from reading some things on Cosmic Variants, and, and often, you know, the posts are, you know, beyond my, my level of expertise, but often they're not. And I mean, you've well, written about everything from... Uh, hunting dinosaur bones to um, science and religion. and you know, There's a nice review you did. It was a, a review of a review of, uh, of, um, of Dawkins' book. Of uh, Dawkins' book, yeah, right. The yeah. God Delusion. That, that was a very, very nice erudite essay, which seemed, <laughs> you know, quite a lot about the... Which, the yeah, which in the old was. days I would have sold to some magazine and gotten yeah. paid for it, but now I give it away for free. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the, that's the great <laughs> thing about all of this. Yeah, we get paid in the very low six figures. <laughs> right, it's, you know, we do it for the glory. And the, the very the low one figures is what but, it is. The, so, very one, the very low zero figures. I but I think this is uh, an interesting thing about blogs, mm -hmm. and it's actually a source of a slight amount of tension between bloggers and their readers, yeah. because blogs can be anything. Yeah. They can be very technical. They can uh, really be, among scientists, a way to share research ideas and mm -hmm. talk about stuff at the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. They can be very non-technical. You can have a scientist who blogs and never mentions science on their blog, yeah. or likewise a literature professor, an economist, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or they could be something in between where yeah. you either try to explain things in a way that is more accessible, and maybe sometimes you talk about things that are not science at all. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of your readers want you to be one of those or the other, and the thing is that you're not being paid to blog. You can blog about whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. So we blog about what we want. Sometimes yeah. we talk about yeah. physics. Sometimes it's in a research way. Sometimes it's in a, you know, back to basics, let's talk about the simple harmonic oscillator way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we talk about what we had for dinner last night or what concert yeah. we went to, and that's what makes it all fun and exciting yeah. to me. Yeah, and it's amazing. It's amazing to be able to... Like, look over the shoulder while someone of the caliber of Joe Polchinski and Lee Smolin are arguing with each other somewhat informally, like in the pages of Cosmic Variants or, mm -hmm. or on uh, Not Even Wrong. And it's something that the general public has really not had the opportunity to do. I mean, us science journalists sometimes get in on these at conferences or stumbling into hallway conversations when we're reporting something, but uh, just to have so much of the raw material of the debate out there in the infosphere. Yeah, I think that personally that is exactly what is the single biggest nice thing about blogs, is yeah. that you can sort of see the sausage being made. Right? Yeah. You can see that science is not either a pristine edifice of correct truths that is gradually accumulated, nor is it uh, a sequence of press releases mm -hmm. mentioning astounding discoveries. It's right. an ongoing process. Right. People right. disagree. They talk. They're smart. Sometimes they're respectful. Sometimes they're less so. Uh, the, the downside of that is, of course, if you read the comments, it's sometimes hard for the outsider to know which comments are by people who are Nobel Prize winners and which ones are by people who... Uh, have their own theories of everything that they came up with there in the basement. Well, yeah, especially but, when so many people are posting with, you know, uh, whimsical nicknames. And <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people out there who are pretty sure that they have figured out stuff that has stumped generations of yeah. establishment scientists. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, but that's also, you know, part of the fun of it. So Yeah, because in the past, really, you know, people would read Science Times or Discover or Scientific American, and you would get these occasional snapshots that would kind mm -hmm. of freeze freeze frame the field that you were interested in at a certain moment and then now you just have this continuing you know, this continuing sausage making mess that you can follow if you're so inclined and it's I wonderful. think so yeah. and, but I think also <laughs> for whatever reason I think it's an interesting sociological phenomenon that physicists in particular and scientists in general have been slow to take up blogging compared to other areas of academia. Hmm. I mean, physicists like to claim pride for inventing the World Wide Web. It yeah. came out of CERN. Yeah. Uh, but when I tell my physics colleagues that if you go to economics or political science or law professors, the most famous, well-established people have blogs. Yeah. It's not just, you know, uh, 
we quirky few. Yeah. And yeah. they're a little bit astonished. Like, they, really? They actually waste their time doing that kind of stuff? Oh. And I think that uh, in fields where the engagement with the interests of people on the street is a little bit more immediate, mm-hmm. the idea of talking to a wider audience is not quite seen as much of as a waste of time. Yeah. And I bet that 20 years from now, that will be true in science as well. Yeah. That, that more people will understand that this is not just a distraction from the real work, yeah. that uh, not only discovering new things about the universe, but talking about those discoveries in this informal context yeah. is a useful contribution. Yeah. Just trying to imagine what the 60s would have been like if Murray Gell-Mann and Richard <laughs> Feynman were, were blogging away. Exactly. Isn't that a, the, like, the greatest uh, tragedy that we don't have that? Yeah, yeah. Because you know that if one of them set up a blog, the other would set it up tomorrow. Oh, yeah, and they would compete <laughs> on who had you know, the really, More the really coolest so software That's and the latest you know, Ajax um, programming. And yep, <laughs> absolutely, yes. That is too bad. Yeah, that's another thing that I I think that's wonderful about Wikipedia. Just sort of continuing this this theme of the wonderful, the wonderful messiness of the internet. And I, I just love Wikipedia. And yet people will say, well, yeah, but how do you know if you read something there that it, you know someone hasn't just you know come through five seconds before and you know inserted some ridiculous error? And um, yet that seems to be happening less and less. And there's so many little little uh, proofreading enzymes in the. <laughs> in the form of all these other Wikipedians that are, you know, everyone monitoring a few articles and protecting them against vandalism. And out of this, you get a pretty pretty good reference. It's something I would Absolutely. never use as my final reference. But for me, the lesson is that there is no final reference. And you, wouldn't use, you shouldn't use Britannica as your final reference either. Good. I think that you've gotten the right lesson. So you, you said <laughs> exactly what I would have said there, which is, you know. You always want to get things from as many different sources as you can and make sure the different sources aren't just echoes off the same source that are, right. you know, ricocheting in the infosphere. And Wikipedia has the benefit of being, you know, having a lot of stuff and having it much more easily accessible than anywhere else. Yeah. So why not use it as your first place to go? Yeah. When I was uh, writing a paper a few months ago about the cosmic microwave background, I needed a certain recursion relation for Legendre polynomials. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have any books with me, and so I looked it up on my laptop on Wikipedia, and there it was. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, I went back and checked it in a real book uh, exactly. later before yeah. I published it. But yeah. uh, why not use that? I think it's great. Yeah, I've been using it. You know, this week I got the copy-edited manuscript back for my next book, The Ten Most Beautiful Experiments. and. Oh, Sometimes okay. I'll just want to really quickly check something. I mean, I know, it absolutely know it's right, but I'll get this nagging feeling. And I know it's when you're absolutely sure something's right and you decide you don't need to check it, that it'll turn out to be wrong. So <laughs> Sometimes if I'm yeah. really in a hurry, I'll just yeah. go on to Wikipedia and I'll figure, well, what's the chance? I know I didn't use Wikipedia as my source, but what's the chance that they would make the same random error that I did? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's very amusing to read, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica has uh, blogs now. And they're defending yeah. their turf as much as they possibly can. Right. You know, trying to down, uh, trying to talk down Wikipedia. But, you know, well, there's, there's nothing about t- me in Wikipedia, not in Encyclopedia Britannica. Exactly. So my loyalties are clear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there's just so many, yeah, so, so many... Um, Times I'll turn to Britannica. I'll turn to that first. I subscribe to their full oh, okay. edition and have for years. And sometimes I just won't find something. Well, for yeah, current events, Wikipedia is amazing. There are people who really yeah. put things in there very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah, it's changing. And I think that the iPhone is another step towards ah. this. I mean, pretty soon every person in the world will be connected everywhere they are. Yeah. It's going to be a different kind of world. It's all happening so much faster than I ever thought it would happen. Yeah, we just got our first car that has a GPS system in it, and now I don't know how I ever got anywhere. Oh, I haven't made that leap yet. <laughs> you become dependent on it very, very quickly, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. And um, um, you, you said we, which gives me another nice good. segue into, um, I understand that uh, you were engaged to not only a blogger, but a science blogger. That's right. And so it's Jennifer... Jennifer Willette. Willette. I wasn't sure if she used a French pronunciation, like that nice little beret she has French in her Canadian cartoons of herself. Yes, and that's right. Jennifer uh, blogs at Cocktail Party Physics. Cocktail Party Physics. That's right. And uh, she's a science writer. 
And uh, her two books are, one is a collection of little essays on the history of science mm -hmm. called Black Bodies and Quantum Cats. And uh, her other one was written on a dare, and it's called The Physics of the Buffyverse. The Buffyverse. Oh, this is Buffy the, the Vampire of, Slayer? That's right. It's the, it's the Buffy the Vampire Slayer version of The Physics of Star Trek. Oh, so she's following in Lawrence Krauss's estimable footsteps. That's right. Oh, this is good. We'll, we'll be sure. We'll, we'll uh, send, when we're done with this, you can email... Uh, Brian links to these. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I, I started looking at her. At her. You referred to her. I guess her blog basically chronicles your. I mean, not in any any detail, but uh, you're you're meeting each other at a conference somewhere in your courtship. And well, actually, yeah. Both Jennifer and I tend to blog not about personal things <laughs> and our love lives or uh, what we uh, what restaurant we went to last night. Yeah. But we decided that. Because we both met through our blogs, that is actually how we met, uh -huh. um, that we should at least post once we got engaged, we should tell our readers that we both got engaged yeah. to each other, and that happened in November, we told the world. She did refer to you by name and not just as future spouse? No, yeah, back then we did admit that we had names, ah. and uh, <laughs> so that's okay, so now we've just become future spouse. And uh, it was really interesting to see the reactions to our engagement post, mm -hmm. though. I mean, we got uh, quoted in Nature magazine about the fact that we were getting engaged, which I think is the first engagement announcement I've ever seen in Nature, <laughs> only because we met on our blogs. That was really cool. And in the New York Times also, it got in there. Uh -huh. uh, and... Uh, and so she's moved to Los Angeles now. Uh -huh. and, but she's a science writer, and her, our blogs are actually very, very different. She can yeah. write. She's yeah. really good at writing, and I think her shortest post is longer than my longest post. Well, yeah, I noticed she's writing. More, it's more like essays. It's a than, skill, yeah. That's yeah, right. well, do you do that, too? <laughs> I mean, I noticed that one person, I, I think you said this yourself, that one of your posts, I think it was the one on, on uh, Dawkins, Dawkins, um, God delusion book was vying for for longest blog longest post ever. ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there was you know that was an accumulation of many many things. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I mean, it's the, another topic that is worth uh, some dissection is the relationship between re religion and science blogs. Yeah, it's my it's second really, favorite topic, I think. Yeah, it's going yeah. to be uh, quite the popular thing uh, for better or for worse. Yeah. 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 But I, I have an unusual upbringing because I'm an, uh, an atheist, but I did go to school as an undergraduate at a Catholic university at Villanova. Oh. So I've taken, you know, many semesters worth of courses about religious studies. Oh, and so that's why you were so up on, um, on Duns Scotus and Aquinas and... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert. I'm not going to claim that I'm an expert. Yeah. I pretend to do that. But, no, uh, but just, you know. But I've been exposed to a lot of these things, and I taught a course with a friend of mine at the University of Chicago mm -hmm. on the history of atheism, oh. which is a very understudied subject, the history yeah. of atheism. Yeah. So we learned a lot, and we had a lot of fun. Yeah, you, you, there was a nice theme in that post where you were talking about basically the history of religion as being this contention between two forces, and one being the the ancient Greek conception of uh, of God, and the mm -hmm. other being the uh, the Jewish tribal Yahweh kind of God, and and that this tension is something that just constantly exists to this day in in religion, and leads to all of these really basic contradictions. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I think that not only is it true that there's famous uh, theological conundrums that basically come down to one or the other version of uh, can God make a rock so heavy that he himself cannot lift it? Right. Uh, but not only do they exist, but they can be traced historically to the different kind of conceptions of a monotheistic God. We, mm -hmm. we started out with a pantheon, which is kind of silly to imagine. It's, it's sort of very obviously mythical and anthropomorphic to have a God of love and a God of uh, war and so forth fighting each other. But it's also, it fits the data pretty well in terms of, you know, we live in a messy world. We don't live in a world that is very, very strictly ordered and yeah. has everything happening nicely. So having a bunch of gods that are warring with each other kind of makes sense from that mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah. So if you want to sort of say that, well, there's only one god, and god is omnipotent and omniscient, but yet we still live in this messy world, yeah. you're going to face 
conundrum. So yeah. Aristotle and the Greeks got out of them by saying, well, God doesn't mess with the world. God just is the prime mover and is sort of some imminent force. Yeah, yeah, the really, the old deistic God that um, so many of the 19th century physicists were perfectly happy with. Absolutely, that's mathematicians. right. Mathematicians. And that's a, there's sort of a theologically respectable stance along those lines. Yeah. But then people also want to believe that uh, praying to God makes a difference. Right. And it's right. reconciling those two ideas that is really, really difficult. That's what really struck me. You know, a couple summers ago when I was uh, in Cambridge, England at this uh, Templeton Science yes. science and Religion thing for journalists, and we'd listen to these people like John Polkinghorne, mm -hmm. and we'd read people like Keith Ward, mm -hmm. and they were not at all... Um, satisfied with this deistic Greek idea of God just set the machine rolling and now we can, if we choose to, we can, you know, talk about, oh, God is just the wonderful, beautiful order of the universe, you know, the way Einstein sort of misled people into thinking he was religiously devout. And, right. Um, well, there's a lot of different versions of sophisticated theology. That's yeah. the thing. I mean, I, to me, there's a version of materialistic atheism mm -hmm. that is kind of simple. You know, yeah. the world is made of stuff, and the stuff follows the laws of physics, and that's everything that there is, yeah. except that you can look at it in different ways, and that's a lot of fun. And yeah. It's a very simple and understandable conception. And people yeah. say, well, if and you if try to... And if anything that doesn't explain, in principle, can or will be explained in the future, but sure, that's you're right. not positing you not the supernatural... The yeah, that's you're, right. You're not just saying that there's this this uh, supernatural realm which is um, off limits. I mean, you know, what in the world could that mean? Well, I posted just the other day about this question of whether or not, if you do believe in such a thing, mm -hmm. should you feel happy or sad that that is the case? Oh yeah, what was that, was that Karl Rove who made that bizarre? Karl Rove. Uh, tried to sort of squeeze himself into a politically acceptable position by saying that I am not fortunate. Fortunate enough to be a person of faith. <laughs> so someone had put him on the spot and asked him if he was a person yes. of faith. In particular, Christopher Hitchens. Oh, Christopher Hitchens asked him that. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. So obviously Karl Rove can't say that, you know, no, I think the whole God stuff is silly, yeah. given yeah. his position. Yeah. Um, but to his own credit, I think, he was at least honest enough to say, no, I'm not uh, a believer. Yeah. Uh, but but he wanted to sort of it. stick that in there that he was regretful that he was not a believer. Not fortunate enough to be a person of faith. That's right. So I asked the question, you know, should we, you know, forget about whether it's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Forget about whether or not God does exist or whether the world is just laws and forces. Mm -hmm. What would we prefer to yeah. be the case? So yeah. I set up, you know, just for purposes of discussion, set up a little thought experiment, you could choose which was the case. Mm -hmm. And of course people come in the comments and say, well, the choice I want to make isn't either one of the, one, of the two you gave me. <laughs> Because, you know, the, I think the materialist point of view is kind of simple and straightforward, but there's an infinite number of ways that you could not be a materialist. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. some of them are going to be very, very um, deistic, very, very Aristotelian, very, very unmoved mover, imminent, transcendent God that keeps the universe going but doesn't interfere with anything. Yeah. Some are going to be very... Fire and brimstone, you know, as soon as those Jews build the temple, God is going to come down and smite your asses. Yeah. Um, and there's a million things in between where, yeah. you know, I, I have seen very respectable theologians use the anthropic principle right. to argue in favor of God, saying, right. you know, the fine structure constant wouldn't have the value it does if someone yeah. didn't make it exactly that value. Right. And for me and presumably you, the same argument could be just used to say, well, it's obviously that it's. Obviously, just what's wonderful fluke, and it has nothing to do it with It could be a fluke. It God. could be environmental selection. Yeah, it could, could be environmental be selection. Uh, it could be the part of the landscape argument. Right. Or it could yeah. be written into the laws of physics, and we just don't understand them yet. Yeah. So I actually, yeah. I don't um, disrespect people who are intellectually serious theologians or religious No, people, I don't either. Because I, you know, some, I've, I've been exposed to these people. Uh, when I was an undergraduate and also later, and some of them are brilliant, and they think very, very carefully yeah. about what they believe in. Yeah. But uh, there are so many versions of that belief that it's hard to engage once and for all mm -hmm. uh, with one of them, because someone yeah. else will say, well, that's not my version. I mean, I just assumed before I went to Cambridge, without knowing much about it, that, that scientists, physicists like Polkinghorne, who are also very religiously devout, um, embrace some kind of deism, and I was very surprised to find that they are actually indeed theists who believe that God answers prayers and intervenes and 
nudges the history of the universe or even of civilization this way yeah. and that, and they would try to come up with ways to justify this using, using say, quantum mechanics or chaos theory. And, and it just seemed to be this amazing amount of special pleading to try to become comfortable in your own head that the science you've learned throughout your adult life is somehow compatible with the religion you happen to be taught growing up as a child. Yeah, and it's, um, again, there's all sorts of different positions one can take along that spectrum. You'll see yeah. people who say, well, that idea that the vision of the Virgin Mary hasn't appeared on a tortilla is ridiculous, yeah. but Jesus really did rise from the dead, you know, three yeah. days later, and, yeah. and sort of everything in between. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and some of it is the physicists who become religious and think like that are often not at all the most sophisticated theological believers. Yeah. I had a, uh, when we taught our course on atheism, we had uh, both of the, the two of us, Shadi Barch and I, who were teaching the course, mm -hmm. were atheists. So we thought that, uh, to be fair, we would bring in a guest speaker who was not, mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless who was an expert on the history of atheism. Mm -hmm. We brought in Father William Buckley mm -hmm. uh, from Boston College, who was an old, uh, very, very charming Jesuit priest. Yeah. Uh, who came in, and uh, he was a University of Chicago alumnus. So he gave some great talks to us, yeah. and very, very sort of close reading, old school, Chicago style uh, academic. Mm -hmm. But at some point he turns to me and says, you don't think that I believe in G-O-D God, do you? Right. <laughs> I said, well, you know, I kind of thought that maybe as a priest you would believe in G-O-D God. But, you know, his viewpoint was much more sophisticated than that. Yeah. Uh, and, and physicists who use the fine-tuning of the laws of nature to argue for God are rarely that sophisticated. Yeah, yeah. But how did you find your uh, experience at the Templeton Retreat? Or oh, the I, it was really, it was very educational as far as just uh, learning why people believe things that before I found completely inexplicable. And now I can see how you could you know, with uh, great efforts, convince yourself of certain things, like an interventionist God. But mostly I was struck by, I and mean, we were exposed to the people who were supposed to be the sharpest thinkers mm -hmm. in the world on this, mm -hmm. one of them being John Polkinghorne. And, and part of um, what we did during the fellowship is we had two months back home in which we were just supposed to read, and they gave us $1,000 each to buy books, okay. <laughs> which is wonderful. They let you pick the books? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so I, you know, I read a lot of this stuff, like Polkinghorne, Keith Ward, and... Um, Swinburne, maybe? Yeah, yeah. And, and I even went back and, and, and read some, some interpretations of Aquinas and mm -hmm. really steeped myself in it. And we came back again and heard, heard um, arguments from these very sophisticated physicist believers. And I still came away thinking that, wow, if we've just heard the strongest ammunition that they have, it's not very persuasive... Yeah, one of one of the uh, one of the nice moments I've had in my academic life was I gave a talk at a theology conference mm -hmm. at a conference on God and physical cosmology, wow. and um, Richard Swinburne was the organizer, and it was mm -hmm. supposed to be about you know a bunch of philosophers and theologians come together to talk about natural religion, how you can go from the observed universe to conclusions about the divine. Yeah. And for entertainment and enrichment purposes, they asked a couple of real cosmologists to come in and talk about cosmology. Yeah. Joel Premack and I were both mm -hmm. asked. Wow. And when I was asked, I said, I'm very happy to come as long as I don't have to talk about cosmology. I want to talk about religion. Yeah. <laughs> and so they said, sure, you can do that. And so mm -hmm. I gave a talk about why I'm an atheist and why you cannot go from mm -hmm. observations of the natural universe yeah. to conclusions about the existence of God. Yeah. And afterward, and they loved it because they thought that they were actually getting something that they weren't usually told. Mm -hmm. they, you know, whether or not they believed it, they were at least yeah. hearing a perspective that they sort of suspected was out there, but no yeah. one was really sharing with them. Yeah. So afterward, uh, you don't expect at a conference like that, after a talk like that, to change anybody's mind. No. You're just trying to sort of share with them what you're thinking. Yeah. And that's fine. That happens at conferences all the time. But afterward, one of them did come up to me and said that I did change his mind. Not about the existence of God, but about the argument from design. Oh. The idea that you could look at the world and discern in it some patterns that were evidence for a designer of some yeah. sort. And he said that before my talk, he thought that was plausible, and afterward he realized that it just could, it was not going to work. Yeah. So, that was yeah. very nice. It was very refreshing that someone would actually change their mind on the basis of hearing it. It is. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, you just pick up a crystal that you find walking on the trail and see this embedded, embedded three-dimensional geometry. And you know, how can you not think that design can arise without a designer? But sure, no. I mean, if yeah. you didn't know any better, uh, yeah. if you didn't have the laws of physics, and you didn't have Darwinian evolution, and you didn't have our notions of cosmology, yeah. I'd be completely willing to believe that uh, the stuff we see out there in the universe had some uh, purpose behind it. Yeah. But I would still be suspicious because, you know, the world is still a messy place. Yeah. You know, the world is full of chaotic, crazy disasters. Right. So it's certainly not a very good fit, even from the start. Yeah, it's just a wonderful tension between order and randomness. That's right. And I think that, you know, I'm, I always just refer back to David Hume's dialogues concerning natural religion, mm -hmm. which did a great job of completely eviscerating the argument from design even before it was fully articulated ah. uh, by William Paley and others. Really? So this was before Paley finding the watch on the heath? Exactly. He did ah. not find the watch and, and the rock and so forth. Ah. Uh, before he'd done that, Hume had basically showed that it was silly. <laughs> yeah, well, but, yeah. didn't he say that, uh, well, it just doesn't get you anywhere, because then you're going to have to figure out a theory for who designed the designer. And Among other things, and he said also, I mean, the really good point, I thought, was that even if you bought this, what conclusions are you going to be able to safely draw about the designer? Yeah. Is it a committee? Was it a graduate student? Was yeah. it a mistake? <laughs> yeah. You know, this is very little from is that. Is it a simulation way. running in a... <laughs> Well, that yeah, that's right. That's, are we just you know in the matrix and so forth? Right, These are all right. really good questions. Yeah, yeah, you can't. It doesn't. It, do, it gives you nowhere to go from there. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And uh, one of the side benefits of the blogosphere is that this is a debate that is happening a little mm -hmm. bit more out there in the open. Yeah. I think that blogs have actually played a role in that because yeah. you know a lot of working scientists, for very very good reasons, don't want to be bothered for the same reasons they don't be bothered in selling their work in some sort of PR sense. Yeah. They don't yeah. want to sort of uh, use their positions as scientists to talk about things like religion or other things outside their yeah. purview. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I sympathize to that. I think that's right in some sense. When, yeah. when, I, when I talk about religion or whatever, I don't say, look, here I am a physicist and this is why you should believe me. Yeah. I try to make an argument and have people yeah. actually believe the argument or disbelieve the yeah. argument. Yeah. But there is a perspective you get from being a working scientist that you can bring to these questions. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you uh, have any special insight is debatable, but you shouldn't be forbidden from talking about it. Yeah. Well, there's some people would argue, and maybe this is a quote from Dawkins, I'm not sure, but that you can't believe in miracles and, and be a scientist. Well, what again... I think that one of the one of my criticisms of the new wave of atheism books yeah. uh, by Dawkins and others, even though I generally agree with their conclusions, is that they were tried they tried to be too comprehensive in their critique of religion. Yeah. They didn't only say it was wrong; they said it was bad, and then they tried to call bad it some, and stupid, yeah, and, evil, yeah. the cause of all the problems of the world, yeah. and yeah. and they tried to come up with some evolutionary psychology explanation yeah. for why people are religious. And it diluted what I thought was a possibly good message of the book, which is just that if you think about the world scientifically, you don't come to the conclusion that there are any supernatural forces at work. Yeah, so you're more of the view that it's something that has out outlived whatever usefulness it had in the past. And well, no, my view is that I don't talk about its usefulness. I want yeah. to talk about whether it's right or wrong. Yeah. Just yeah. like with the landscape in string theory, uh, it may or may not be encouraging or discouraging. It may yeah. or may not make it harder or easier to make predictions. What I care about is, is it right or is it wrong? Right. And likewise with religion, there are certainly good things that religion yeah. does. Religion makes people uh, happy in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. It leads to good charities. It mm -hmm. gives people a sort of social locus of their communal lives in certain circumstances in addition to various bad things that it might do. Yeah, but it's not very good at explaining If it's not world. right, <laughs> then I would prefer to yeah. find other ways to get those benefits that do not rely on statements about the universe that are not right. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are able to, you know, some very good scientists are able to be religious believers, but they don't use their religious beliefs as um, the basis for their 
their physical theories. Right. I mean, that's why I don't want to agree with Dawkins's quote that he just said, that you can't be a good scientist and believe in miracles, because there are plenty of good scientists who believe in miracles. Yeah. I mean, yeah. empirically, there are plenty yeah. of people who do great science as a matter of fact, yeah. and yet are religious. Yeah. You can't deny that. I think most people like that compartmentalize and really have just, you know, two different ways of thinking about two different things, and in some ways the subject matter is completely different anyway. I mean, you can certainly easily be a deist and, and, um, and, have that, and have all of your physics subsumed into that, but I don't think most people try to reconcile them or subsume one into the other, and it's just, um, you know, just a few people that feel compelled to do this that you know, drive a lot of the debate. It is interesting, though, that on the physics or biology or science blogs more generally, the percentage to talk about religion is much higher than on the economics or law professor or yeah. English professor blog. Yeah. Well, it's, I know it's something, whenever you write about it, you get you know, more email than you do about anything else. And right. And people say, why are you talking about this? And you go, well, somehow people seem to be interested in it. Yeah. They seem yeah. to matter to people, and it affects yeah. the world. So yeah. I think it's worth writing about. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess we, well, we've managed to talk more than an hour here. This is we've gone past an hour. We didn't even get to the plates, which is too yeah. bad. Yeah, I'll just mention them briefly. Um, you know, whenever we, whenever I, I spend so much of my time writing about a lot of this really cutting edge theory and you know the super string theory, M's theory, the landscape, the dark energy problem, and and or I like writing a lot about. Um, Science and religion and philosophy mm -hmm. of science. So just recently it was nice to do this really down-to-earth, very basic story that I had in the Science Times on Tuesday about this beautiful collection of glass photographic plates at uh, Harvard Observatory there in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yeah, I actually, as an undergraduate, uh, I spent a year uh, at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Oh, I, that's summer, right. Rather. So you were there up on up on Garden Street. That's right. I was there for the summer, and then yeah. I later went back for graduate school. And um, I was, at the time, as an undergraduate, I was not doing uh, fun theoretical cosmology. I was doing fun observational stellar astronomy. Mm -hmm. And uh, my undergraduate advisor, Edward Guinan, used those plates to collect data, photometry yeah. data about stars. And they're these big pieces of glass that are photographs of the sky from 100 years ago or so. Yeah. And people say, what possibly well, good can they be? They're not as high quality as uh, what we have now, which is true, but the sky changes. The sky yeah. is not always the same. And knowing yeah. what stars were like 100 years ago oh, it's amazing. is invaluable data. Oh, it's, I mean, basically they have covered the entire sky, southern and northern sky, for a hundred years, with right. anywhere from hundreds to more than a thousand pictures of each spot of the sky, all on these glass plates, a half a million of them, you know, tons yeah. and tons of glass, and and they're just starting this project to um, to digitize it. That's right. Stitch yeah, it all overdue. together into this online map. It's just wonderful. And they need money. If anyone out there listening has two million dollars <laughs> to slide their way. Uh, yeah. But I want to say, George, that was a great story, actually. Oh, well, thanks. Thank and you. I very much enjoyed reading it. And uh, it's also true that if you compare science as it is practiced to science as one gets a feeling for it by reading it in newspapers, mm -hmm. stuff like theoretical cosmology and string theory and so forth and particle physics is vastly disproportionately represented yeah. in yeah. the imagination. And it's great to see um, all these wonderful stories about the nitty-gritty of how real science is done and the yeah. fact that, you know, uh, we need to know how many of the grains on this photographic plate were exposed 100 years ago at this telescope in Massachusetts, and how that affects what we think about how yeah. stars evolve. It's just wonderful getting down to the basics there and looking at the old journals in which they you know, wrote in cursive with fountain pens. And yep. Well, this, yeah. is why, this is why I enjoy blogging about my uh, trip to Wyoming going dinosaur hunting. Oh, yes, right. That must have been great. It's such a different tangible experience than... Yeah. My yeah. professional work, which involves going to Starbucks and sitting down with a pencil and paper and writing <laughs> equations, uh, and, I, and I relate those equations to multi-billion dollar experiments that people do in, uh, in the mountains or in the sky, yeah. but a lot of science involves you know, hopping in an airplane and bringing your burlap with you and uh, going out there on your hands and knees and digging. And yeah. That's still a lot of yeah. how, it, how it's done, and that's how it needs to be done. You know, I loved reading about these old astronomers, or well, they weren't old then, but they were these 
these young astronomers mm -hmm. going all over South America and climbing to the top of mountains looking for the perfect place to set up a telescope and expose these glass plates and then carry them down the mountain on mule back to ship them to That's Boston right. Harbor. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, of course, the Harvard computers, the women who were employed. Yeah, yeah, like Henrietta Swan Levitt. Right, without whom we wouldn't know how big the universe is. That's so. right, that's right. Yeah, those were the days. Yeah. yeah. Well, Sean, it's great talking to you. Let's do this again. All right, great, George. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. I had a great and, time. And, and do you suppose that uh, the, the future spouse might want to do a show with me? Future spouse would love to do blogging heads, I'm sure. I will excellent. speak for her. Yeah, please, please ask her. <laughs> yes. No, I will good. ask her. She would be great. Oh, excellent. Okay, well, we can, uh, I guess, press our stop buttons here and then ship this off to the home office. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, Sean. Bye. Bye.